The Gauls were one of Rome's oldest and most bitter enemies. They had sacked Rome and throughout the centuries fought alongside the Republic's most dangerous adversaries, including Pyrrhus and Hannibal. By the end of the 2nd century BC, southern Gaul was largely subdued, however there was still tension in northern Gaul, particularly along the Rhine. These tensions would ultimately climax in the Gallic Wars, the conflict that would shape the future of Western Europe for centuries to come, giving rise to the Holy Roman Empire and modern-day France, the conflict that would forever etch the name Gaius Julius Caesar in the annals of history. Rome had been rocked by almost half a century of civil wars, and the Republic was in decline. Both Marius and Sulla had marched on Rome, highlighting the ineffectiveness of the system for maintaining a large empire, and the fact that the legionaries were more loyal to their generals than to the state. Following this chaotic period, three men had established an unofficial alliance to effectively control the Republic. This was the first triumvirate, consisting of the famous general Pompey the Great, the richest man in Rome, Crassus, and Julius Caesar. Caesar had been consul the year before in 59 BC, but his political campaigning had left him in debt and made him many enemies in Rome. He needed to make money fast and gain enough military success to keep his political adversaries at bay. When the time came for distributing provinces for Caesar to govern as proconsul, he was able to use his political allies to secure Cisalpine Gaul, Illyricum, and Transalpine Gaul for an unprecedented five years. This put Caesar in control of four veteran legions, the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, all of whom had fought with Caesar before in Hispania and were loyal to him. They had a total of roughly 22,000 legionaries, plus auxiliaries. Caesar now had the men he needed. All he needed was an excuse for war. Fortunately for Caesar, a Celtic tribe, the Helvetii, was planning a migration into Gaul in 58 BC. Their leader, Oregtorix, had formed a confederation with a number of neighbouring tribes, the Tolingi, Latubrigi, Rauraki and Boii, and now they numbered 368,000 men, women and children. Oregtorix had even convinced them all to burn their homes in order to leave no option of failure. However, soon he was accused of being a tyrant and was forced to commit suicide. Command passed to Divico. Divico was determined to stick to the plan, and began amassing supplies in order to start pouring into Gaul. To do this, they would either have to pass through the land of the Roman ally Edui and the province of Transalpine Gaul, or take the longer route through the mountain passes in the north. The Romans had built up a healthy fear of migrating tribes following the Cimbrian War in 113 to 101 BC. And so Caesar, hearing of this, was only too willing to come to the rescue of the Edui. He took the only available legion in the area and force marched them up to Geneva, destroying the bridge on the Rhone that provided access into Transalpine Gaul. The Helvetii appealed to Caesar, asking for military access through Roman lands and promising they would not attack. Caesar played for time, pretending to consider this offer for almost 15 days. Using this time, his legion was able to construct a fortified embankment almost 5 meters high, stretching 20 miles along the riverbank. With the legion manning the embankment and now in a stronger position, Caesar denied the Helvetii access and refused to allow them to cross. Some of the Helvetii ignored this and attempted to cross nonetheless in small boats, but were prevented from doing so by the legionaries throwing javelins and shooting arrows into them. With the southern route thus blocked, the Helvetii decided to take the longer northern route through the mountains into Gaul. Leaving his top lieutenant, Labienus, in command, Caesar returned to Italy to levy a further two legions and to pull the other three veteran legions out of their winter quarters in Aquileia, 
bringing his total to approximately 33,000 legionaries plus auxiliaries. Despite Labienus being in a strong position to easily block the mountain pass, the Helvetii managed to push into Gallic territories and began ravaging the land. The Gauls pleaded with Caesar to intervene and chase the Helvetii out, and Caesar, yet again, was only too willing to help, marching his legions into the Gallic territories. The decision of Labienus to not hold the Helvetii in the mountains was likely an order received from Caesar. The Celts were now in open terrain, which better suited the Roman legions, and their pillaging of Gaul gave Caesar an excuse to intervene. Word reached Caesar that the Helvetii were currently attempting a crossing at the Ara River. They had been crossing in four large groups, using many rafts and boats, but due to the size of the horde and their lack of organization, the crossing had already taken them days, and one group was still yet to cross. Caesar took his legions and swiftly marched to the river. Quickly forming his legions into battle formation, Caesar fell upon the Celts waiting to cross. Caught unaware, unprepared and encumbered by their baggage, the Helvetii did not even have enough time to form a proper battle line. The fighting was over quickly, with the whole stranded group being killed or fleeing into the nearby woods, whilst the other three groups could do nothing but watch helplessly from the other side of the river. The main Helvetii force began to move on, and, not wanting to lose the initiative, Caesar quickly built a bridge across the river and moved all of his six legions across. The crossing that had taken the Celts 20 days had taken the Romans just one. Caesar began tailing the Helvetii, waiting for the right time to strike. There were a few minor cavalry skirmishes, but nothing decisive. Caesar did once manage to find a battlefield that was advantageous, and even had Labienus in position behind the enemy. However, due to poor communication from his scouts, Caesar was forced to pull back from the battlefield. This caused a delay in Caesar's plan, and he was beginning to run low on rations. He decided to head for the nearby town of Bibracta to resupply his army before continuing the pursuit. As he began to march off, however, Divico gave chase, harassing the rear of the Roman army. Caesar sent his cavalry and light infantry to fight a delaying action in order to buy time to deploy his main force on a nearby hill. The four veteran legions formed three lines at the front, with the two newly levied legions, along with the auxiliaries, positioned further up the hill. These men were not tested in battle, and so were not expected to do any of the fighting. Instead, they were to guard the baggage and were spread thin across the hill to seemingly increase the size of Caesar's army. The Helvetii, numbering somewhere between 60 to 90,000 warriors, had successfully fought off the Roman cavalry and light infantry, forcing them to retreat. Now they had formed their infantry into a tightly packed shield wall and advanced on the Romans. The front two lines of legionaries opened the battle with a volley of javelins. These hampered the Helvetii by becoming stuck in their shields, forcing them to drop them and break into a looser formation. With the shield wall in disarray, the Roman front lines charged into melee. The fighting was intense and tough, but the Romans' discipline and experience gave them the edge. Slowly, they began to get the upper hand, with the Helvetii being forced back to a nearby mountain. However, as the Romans pressed up the mountain, a portion of the Helvetii allies, composed of Boii and Tolingi, roughly 15,000 warriors, entered the battle. These men had been acting as a rearguard, protecting the camp, and now they fell on the Roman flank, threatening to encircle them. The Helvetii, bolstered by the arrival of their allies, began pushing back with renewed vigour. With the two front lines of legionaries already engaging the Helvetii on the mountain, Caesar committed his final line of veterans, which had been acting as a reserve. 
After hours of hard fighting, the Helvetii on the mountain were eventually broken and forced from the battle. However, the Boei and Tulingi fell back to the camp to make a last stand. Using their baggage wagons, they formed a makeshift rampart and continued the fight, hurling missiles down into the Roman ranks. This is where the fighting was the most difficult, as the Boii were famed warriors and fought desperately. Finally, after fighting long into the night, the third line was able to break into the camp, ending the battle. The battle had lasted almost 12 hours. Caesar had lost perhaps 5,000 men, whilst the Helvetii had lost around 40 to 60,000. Of the 368,000 people who began the migration, only 130,000 were now left. Caesar, with no cavalry to speak of, was not able to give chase immediately, and gave his men three days in order to recover from the battle before starting the pursuit. The Helvetii, seeing the Romans chasing them once more, surrendered completely and were forced to return to their homeland and made a vassal of Rome, acting as a buffer between Roman and Germanic lands. Caesar had achieved his aim of gaining a swift military victory, and for now he would be able to hold off his political enemies in Rome. Furthermore, the Romans had now shown themselves to be a powerful force in the Gallic theatre. After his victory, Caesar rested in Bibracte for a short time before moving on. Rumour had already reached him of a Germanic tribe that had crossed the Rhine and was terrorising Gaul. The Suebi, led by their king Ariovistus, had first arrived in Gaul in 63 BC as mercenaries for the Sequani and Averni in their war against the Aedui, a Roman ally. The 15,000 warriors that Ariovistus initially brought proved decisive, helping to secure a crucial victory over the Aedui at the Battle of Magito Briga, which forced the Aedui to become a tributary to the Sequani. In response to this, the Aedui sent an envoy, Davicius, to ask Rome for help, but the Republic was still recovering from the political shock of the Catiline conspiracy and was distracted by an Allobroges revolt. The governor of Transalpine Gaul was ordered to help Rome's Gallic allies when possible, and in 59 BC, the Senate named Ariovistus a friend of the people of Rome to pacify him and keep him in check. Ariovistus used that time to consolidate his position. After helping the Sequani, he demanded a third of their lands as payment. The Sequani gave in, and Ariovistus began moving more of his people across the Rhine to settle in this new land. By 58 BC, as many as 120,000 Swabi had now crossed the Rhine and made their home in Gaul. Furthermore, Ariovistus was demanding more Sequani territory in order to settle an extra 24,000 Germans and had been taking hostages in order to keep the Sequani and Edui obedient. Something had to be done. Following his victory over the Helvetii, Caesar had taken some time to rest in Bibracte. Whilst encamped there, he was visited by a council of Gallic leaders and diplomats, led by Divicius. They complimented Caesar on his victory and implored him to intervene in the situation, pointing out that if the Germans continued their conquests, soon the Suebi would be directly bordering Roman territory. Caesar, again, was happy to oblige. As Ariovistus was a friend of Rome, however, Caesar could not immediately go to war. Instead, Caesar first invited Ariovistus to meet him, which was declined. Then he sent a diplomat to Ariovistus, asking him to return the Gallic hostages he had taken and to stop any hostilities. Caesar reminded him that if he were to comply, the Romans would still consider him a friend of Rome and not take any action against him. This was a good deal for Ariovistus. He'd be allowed to keep the lands he had already taken from the Sequani without a fight. 
Instead of accepting the terms, Ariovistus doubled down and sent a message back to Caesar saying that if the Romans could conquer where and how they liked, so could he. At the same time, the 24,000 new Germans who had crossed the Rhine were allowed to raise and pillage the Gallic lands as they pleased, with more Germans preparing to cross the river to join Ariovistus. Caesar now had his justification, as he had a legal decree from the Senate to protect Rome's Gallic allies. He could justify that the Suebi were threatening Rome's borders, and Ariovistus had forfeited his status as a friend of Rome by continuing to pillage the land of Rome's allies. Yet again, Caesar had the chance to market himself as the saviour of Gaul. Gathering his six legions, roughly 30,000 men, Caesar set out on the warpath. Both Ariovistus and Caesar recognized the importance of Visontio, the largest town in the Sequani territories. Well fortified and well supplied, it would be crucial to the war effort. Both forces began marching to the town, however the Romans, marching day and night, were able to get there first. Caesar rested there briefly while supplying the legions. But as they rested, rumours began reaching the men of the strength and ferocity of the Germans. Even some of Caesar's officers began having their doubts, and it almost seemed as if Caesar would have a mutiny on his hands. Caesar was, however, able to restore order by insisting that he would face Ariovistus with just his most trusted 10th legion if none others would follow. This inspired a fanatical loyalty in the 10th legion, whilst the others, motivated by shame at being thought of as cowards, rallied, and the legions began to march out to meet the Suebi. Ariovistus, impressed with the speed at which the Romans had been able to move and take Vesontio, sent messages to Caesar asking for a meeting, with only some cavalry allowed as bodyguards, at the place called Vosges in modern-day Alsace. Caesar agreed, but the meeting did not go well, with both generals reiterating their positions. Ariovistus even went so far as to say that if he were to kill Caesar, there would be many in Rome that would be grateful, showing that he knew what the political situation in Rome was. Negotiations broke down after this, and the cavalry on both sides had a minor skirmish before retreating back to their respective camps. A few days later, Ariovistus asked for another meeting. Caesar, sensing a trap, sent his translators. This was just as well, as Ariovistus promptly captured the two and even considered burning them alive. With his plan to capture Caesar having failed, Ariovistus instead moved to battle. His army was composed of 6,000 cavalry, 16,000 light infantry, and the rest heavier infantry for a total of around 30 to 40,000 men. Taking Caesar by surprise, Ariovistus marched his force quickly behind Caesar's position and set up camp, cutting off the Romans from their supply lines. For five days, Caesar drew out his army in battle formation, willing to give battle, but Ariovistus was content to wait and strangle Caesar's supply line, only engaging in cavalry skirmishes. The Suebi cavalry fought in a unique fashion. For every horseman, there was an infantryman mixed into their formation. These men were lightly armed in order to keep up with the cavalry, and together provided a flexible and difficult force to handle, and the Roman cavalry got the worse of the fighting. Caesar, knowing that he would have to do something to break the stalemate or else risk being starved out, formed his legions into three lines. He marched this force past the Swaby position and ordered the third line to begin construction of a second camp, whilst the first two lines formed up to defend them. Ariovistus sent all of his light infantry and cavalry to harass the legionaries, but seemed reluctant to commit his entire force, and so they were easily held off by the Romans. With the second camp complete, 
Caesar left two legions and part of his auxiliaries to defend it, whilst his other four legions returned to the main camp. Realizing that Caesar would now be able to use this second camp to reconnect with his supply line, Ariovistus sent part of his army to attack this second camp. The fighting was tough, lasting from midday into the evening, but eventually the Romans were able to repel the attack and even took some prisoners. Upon questioning these Suebi, Caesar learnt that Ariovistus had apparently been told by his priests not to commit his army until after the new moon, which was why he had not used his whole army to prevent the legions constructing their second camp. Having learnt this, Caesar decided to go on the offensive. Leaving a small garrison in each camp, Caesar formed his six legions into a triple axis formation with his cavalry in reserve and marched on the Swaby camp. The Germans came out to meet him, forming their wagons and baggage train into a semicircle behind them, their women standing on them urging the men on. Noticing that the German left flank was slightly weaker, Caesar positioned himself opposite on the Roman right and gave the order for his men to charge. But as he did, the Suebi also charged. Their assault was so fast and surprising that the Romans had to drop their peeler before they could even throw them, drawing their swords and fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Germans managed to form a shield wall and neither side seemed able to gain an upper hand. Having been unable to throw their javelins before charging, the Romans struggled to break the shield wall as easily as they had at the Battle of Bibractae. After some hard fighting, the Roman right, led by Caesar, started to push back the German left. However, the Suebi on the right outnumbered their Roman opponents and were starting to get the upper hand. The Roman cavalry, led by the son of Triumvir Marcus Licinius Crassus, Publius, had not yet engaged in the battle, and from his position he could see the Roman left starting to crumble. Using his own initiative, Crassus led the third line, which had been kept in reserve, to support the flank, arriving just in time to avoid a disaster. With their left flank broken and their right now under severe pressure, the Suebi army broke and ran. It is not known how many people died in this battle, but the Germans attempting to retreat through their wagons were said to have been packed so tightly that the dead could not even fall over. The entire Suebi force, including Ariovistus, fled back across the Rhine, pursued by the Roman cavalry. Caesar had won two important campaigns in one season. For now, he left Labienus to winter with the legions in Sequani territory, whilst he attended to his governing duties in Cisalpine Gaul. But by wintering his legions in Gallic territory, Caesar was making a point. This was beginning to look less like intervention and more like occupation. With the Germanic threat dealt with, Caesar would be able to turn his attention to Gaul proper. The Belgae were a loose collection of various tribes and had fought constant wars with the Germanic tribes across the Rhine, which had fostered a strong and experienced warrior culture. They knew of how successful Caesar had been in Gaul already and were justifiably suspicious of his intentions. To counter the rising Roman threat, the Belgae formed a confederation led by King Galba of the Suessiones. Labienus sent word of this coalition to Caesar in Cisalpine Gaul, who immediately took action. Caesar raised a further two legions and moved straight to the Belgae border. It is worth noting that Caesar now had eight legions under his command, approximately 44,000 men including auxiliaries, double the amount he had initially been allocated by the Senate. Furthermore, while the Belgae raising an army could certainly be seen as a potential threat, Caesar made no efforts to get the Casus Bellus he had when fighting the Helvetii and Suebi. The Republic had less and less control over Caesar, 
and many in Rome were beginning to talk about these conquests not being in Rome's best interest, but in Caesar's. Nevertheless, Caesar marched his legions quickly into the territory of the nearest Belgic tribe, the Remi, who were completely taken aback by the speed at which the Romans had been able to mobilize and surrendered instantly, swearing to Caesar that they had never been a part of the confederation. The Remi even provided Caesar with all the information they had on the alliance, including which tribes were involved, how many men each tribe was contributing, and that they were currently marching towards the Remi's territory. With this information, Caesar convinced his Gallic allies, the Adui, led now by Divitiacus, to invade the lands of the Belovaci, a powerful Belgae tribe, to open a second front, while he marched towards the Belgic alliance's main army. Caesar crossed a bridge over the Axona River and encamped in a strong position on a hill on the other side. The river provided protection from the rear, and marshy land at his front made a frontal assault difficult. Furthermore, Caesar had learned his lesson from fighting Ariovistus, and left six cohorts in a well-fortified position on the other side of the bridge, securing his supply line. With no chance of being starved out from his position, Caesar waited for the Belgae to make their move. Meanwhile, the Belgae had marched to the Remi town of Bibrax, just eight miles from where Caesar was encamped, and besieged it. Caesar gives the total number of the confederation as 300,000. However, it is unclear how much this number is exaggerated, and how many of these men were currently in the army. A more realistic estimation would be somewhere around 80,000 men still a force to be reckoned with, almost double that of Caesar's. In the face of such a large force, the Remi sent messages to Caesar, saying that they would be unable to hold the town without his help. Caesar, however, was reluctant to give up his defensive position, as he thought that the attack on Bibrax was a trap designed to force him to do that. Instead, he kept his legions in camp, but sent a substantial contingent of auxiliaries, composed mainly of Cretan archers and Balearic slingers, to sneak into Bibrax to help the Remi. With Bibrax thus reinforced, and Caesar not taking the bait, Galba instead marched his army to meet the Romans, encamping just two miles from the Roman camp. Caesar was reluctant to engage Galba straight away, and instead focused on cavalry skirmishes to test the strength of the Belgae. While this was going on, he further reinforced his position, digging long trenches and constructing defensive towers on the flanks of his position. Realizing that attacking such a strong position would be suicidal, Galba instead sent roughly 15 to 20,000 men to ford the river and attack the six cohorts on the other side, hoping either to draw Caesar from the hill or to cut off his supply line and starve him out. Seeing this, Caesar gathered all his light infantry and cavalry and marched quickly to oppose the crossing, leaving his legions in their defensive position. The Roman cavalry arrived just in time and fell upon the few Belgae who had made it to the other bank, killing many and forcing them back into the river. At the same time, the Roman missile troops peppered the Belgae still in the water with stones, javelins and arrows. They doggedly tried to continue their crossing despite taking heavy casualties, but Galba had no choice but to pull his men back. To make matters worse, word had now reached him that the Edui were rampaging through the Belovaki lands. With the Romans to his front so heavily dug in, and with another army now threatening his flank, Galba decided to withdraw. The tribes would all disperse to their respective homelands, but all agreed to reassemble if the Romans marched further into Belgae lands. As the confederation's army dispersed, Caesar cautiously pursued with his cavalry and three legions under Labienus, harassing the Belgae. Due to their lack of coordination, the Belgae suffered heavy casualties in this retreat. 
The battle had cost the Confederation approximately 10,000 men and had forced the tribes to divide, making them easier for Caesar to conquer. Many tribes simply surrendered in the face of the Roman legions, including the Bellovaci and Galbus Suessiones. However, deeper in Belgae territory, the Nervi did have the time to organize and were not going to give up so easily. They were outraged by Caesar's foray into Belgae territory, and alongside their neighbours, the Virumandui, Atribates, and Aduatuki, were able to gather an army of approximately 50,000 men, led by the Nervii king, Bodugnatus. Caesar, hearing that this force was gathering against him, marched for the river Sabis on the edge of Nervii territory. Bodugnatus had learned the lesson from Galba and knew that he could not allow the Romans the chance to fortify their position, and so he positioned his men in ambush on a hill on the other side of the river. He also had his troops construct hedge-like obstructions which were placed on the other side of the river to disrupt the Roman formations and cavalry. Caesar marched his army in two groups. His veteran six legions, who marched in the front, were the first to reach the river and began constructing a camp on the hill with the river in front, while the two newer legions marched behind with the baggage train. Caesar sent his cavalry and light infantry across the river, which was only three feet deep, in order to scout the opposite bank. They were met by some Nervii cavalry and a brief skirmish broke out. However, the Belgae cavalry fell back, drawing in the Romans until the entire Nervii force broke cover and fell upon them. The Roman cavalry and light infantry broke and ran back across the river to the Roman camp, the Nervii army in hot pursuit. Thus started the Battle of the Sabis River. The Belgae moved from the woods and across the river so fast that the legions had almost no time to prepare. However, their experience and discipline kicked in. Rallying to the nearest cohort and legionary standards, they were able to put together a coherent battle line. But as the legionary engineers did not have time to clear the campsite as they usually would, the legions were divided by the hedge-like obstructions laid down by Bodugnatus, which prevented them from forming a cohesive formation. As a result, the legions were almost fighting three separate battles, the 10th and the 9th on the left against the Atribati, the 11th and 8th in the centre against the Virumandui, and the 12th and 7th on the right against the largest group, the Nervi, with two remaining legions, still with the baggage train, yet to join the battle. The fighting was brutal, with Caesar himself going from group to group, encouraging his men. Eventually, the Roman left was able to push their enemy back enough to hurl their javelins into their ranks and charge. They were able to force the Atribati back across the river, even making it into the Belgae camp. The Roman centre was also finding success, pushing the Viramandui down to the banks of the river. However, the Roman right was having a hard time. With the centre pushing forwards, the Nervii poured into the gap, almost surrounding the 12th and 7th legions and falling upon the auxiliaries who had retreated to the camp. The remaining auxiliaries, including most of the Roman cavalry who had been marching in front of the baggage train, saw this and fled, assuming the Roman right had been completely destroyed and the battle lost. They were not without reason. The 12th had lost their standard, their chief centurion, most of the other centurions, and the Romans were beginning to break. Seeing this disaster, Caesar knew he would have to do something or risk losing the whole campaign. Snatching up a shield, he pushed himself to the front line of the legion, bolstering the morale of the men. With the 7th legion under heavy pressure as well, Caesar ordered them to form a defensive square with the 12th and hold their ground. At this point, the battle began to swing in the Romans' favour. 
Labienus, in charge of the 10th and 9th legions, saw what was happening from the other side of the river and sent the 10th to relieve the Roman right. While the remaining two legions had finally joined the battle and were attacking the Nervii in the Roman camp. The Roman auxiliary cavalry also returned to the battle, seeing this change in fortune, and now it was the Nervii who faced disaster. The Viramandui had fled upon seeing the Roman reinforcements, and the Nervii were now surrounded. They fought bravely, and even Caesar commended them later, but their defeat was now inevitable. The Belgae casualties were devastating, Caesar saying that just 500 survived the battle. The Roman losses had also been high, with perhaps as many as 5,000 Romans dead. Without Caesar's personal leadership and the timely interventions of the legions, it is likely that the battle would have been lost, Caesar killed, and the campaign ended. But the battle was over, and Caesar was once again victorious. The Nervii surrendered, becoming a vassal of Rome, and the Atrebati were conquered soon after. Rome was now in control of most of Gaul. By 56 BC, Caesar had subjugated the majority of Gaul, either through conquest or political alliances, and was beginning to look for new opportunities to expand Rome's influence. But not all the Gallic tribes were taking kindly to Roman rule. One such tribe was the Veneti, located in modern Brittany. Despite signing a peace treaty with Caesar the year before, they reneged on this promise and captured a few Roman officers. As a largely seafaring nation, the Veneti were confident that they would be able to put their faith in their navy and force Caesar to make concessions. However, Caesar spent no time trying to negotiate, instead seeing the act as a direct declaration of war and marched on the tribe. Initially, he found little success. Due to their large navy, the Veneti were able to effectively hop from town to town, moving entire populaces and their belongings, denying the Romans a pitched battle or siege. Standard Roman tactics proved ineffective, therefore, and it was clear that, in order to win, Caesar had to defeat the navy. With no navy on hand, he ordered that a fleet be built in order to take on the Veneti navy. But compared to the Roman ships, which were designed for the Mediterranean, the Veneti ships, designed for the Atlantic, were much stronger and taller, and the Romans found them impossible to ram or board. It was only through the ingenuity of one of his legates, Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus, who suggested that they use billhooks to cut down the sails and cripple the Veneti boats, that Caesar was able to defeat their navy. With this issue sorted, it now seemed that Caesar would be able to move on to new conquests. Once again though, his plans were put on hold in 55 BC, when yet another roaming German horde, composed of Usipetes and Tenchtheri, began threatening the Rhine border. These tribes previously rivaled the Suebi, but were now fleeing in huge numbers. Caesar giving their total number, including civilians, as 430,000. They had already slaughtered the Menapii and stolen their ships in order to cross the river and were now pouring into Gaul. Upon hearing about this, Caesar was once again compelled to act, as he was worried that the Gauls might join the Germans in an attempt to oust the Romans. Some Gallic tribes in the Rhine Valley had indeed sent emissaries to the Germans, providing them with food and intelligence, encouraging them to move deeper into Gaul. Caesar gathered a council of Gallic chiefs, and convinced them to provide more cavalry for him to confront the Germans. This served two purposes. Firstly, Rome's cavalry had always been lacking, and the Gauls were renowned horsemen, and so filled a crucial role in the army. And secondly, because cavalry was composed largely of nobles or wealthy persons, they would act as hostages, ensuring good behaviour. He then gathered five of his legions and headed to the Rhine. 
the Germans had sent a portion of their cavalry ahead of their main force in order to carry out raiding missions. But hearing that Caesar was getting close, they sent emissaries in order to delay him. They asked Caesar to negotiate, claiming that they were only in Gaul because they had been forced to flee from the Suebi and promised to ally with Rome if Caesar could provide them with land in Gaul. However, Caesar suspected that the Germans were delaying and continued his advance. The envoys continued back and forth as Caesar continued to progress towards the German camp, sending forward his 5,000 cavalry as an advanced force, but with orders not to provoke them into attack. However, upon seeing the Roman cavalry separated from the main force, the Germans fell upon them. The Romans initially tried to hold their ground, but were eventually overwhelmed and retreated to the safety of Caesar's camp. Caesar likely underplays the amount of casualties taken, giving the number as 74, but he does mention that two brothers of the famous and influential Piso family had died in the fighting, something that Caesar could not let go unpunished. Refusing to hold back any longer, Caesar gathered his force to attack the Germans. But before he moved off, the Germans sent a party of diplomats, including high-ranking nobility, to treat with Caesar, once again asking for peace and apologizing for the attack. As the Germans had already attacked apparently without provocation, Caesar refused and took the delegates as prisoners. He then drew up his army in three lines and moved swiftly to the German camp. The Germans, assuming that Caesar still would have been delayed by their envoys, were caught completely unaware. The legions fell upon their camp. Caesar brushes over the details, but it seems to have been somewhat of a massacre. The fleeing Germans were pursued by the Roman cavalry. Some made it across the river in their boats, but many tried to swim across and drowned. Hearing of the defeat, the German cavalry, which had been pillaging, returned across the Rhine. Caesar's army had taken minimal casualties. It is important to note that while Caesar portrayed this as a great victory against a marauding Germanic horde, this is not how others saw it. To Caesar's political rivals in Rome, Caesar had broken the armistice with the Germans by antagonizing them with his cavalry imprisoned diplomats, which was effectively a declaration of war, and then carried out a massacre, including civilians. Caesar needed something to distract the Senate and win the minds of the people, so he decided to boost his popularity by doing what no Roman general had ever done before, crossing the Rhine. The Germanic tribe Ubii offered its ships, hoping that the Romans would assist in their war against the Suebi, Caesar, however, deemed this unworthy of the Roman people, and instead decided to build a bridge across the Rhine between modern Andenach and Neuwied. It was an engineering marvel. The legion's engineers used winches to act as pile drivers, driving stakes deep into the river, and constructed the 140 to 400 meter by 7 to 9 meter bridge in just 10 days. Caesar found the lands beyond the Rhine almost deserted. Taken aback by the Roman speed and their feat of engineering, the Germanic tribes in the area had retreated deep into the Germanic forests, where they had amassed a significant army. However, Caesar had no desire to be caught in a prolonged campaign in foreign territory against a notoriously dangerous enemy. He spent just 18 days on the German side of the Rhine, burning villages and crop fields before returning and dismantling the bridge. The campaign was a proof, not only to the Germans but also to Caesar's rivals in Rome, that he could overcome anything and do as he pleased. Caesar's next ambition, Britain, was once again a perfect propaganda target. The island was on the edge of the known world and rumoured to be a land of monsters and vast riches. It had remained effectively untouched, and bringing it into Rome's sphere of influence would be a significant achievement. According to Caesar, the Britons had provided some of the Gallic tribes with the resources needed to make war. While this was a weak casus belli, 
Caesar was, by now, effectively doing what he wanted with little oversight. He began gathering intel from the Gallic merchants and sent a small reconnaissance force to the island, whilst he mustered the ships he used against the Veneti and prepared to cross with the 7th and 10th legion. He set sail from modern Calais and safely made it across with most of his army, but his cavalry had been delayed by bad weather. The Romans saw the Britons had amassed along the white cliffs of Dover in huge numbers, with infantry, cavalry and chariots, and with every warrior painted in fierce blue war paint. Caesar moved further down the coast in order to find a better place to land, but was shadowed by the Britons' cavalry and chariots, who were easily able to keep pace with the fleet. When the Romans finally found a suitable beach, Caesar arranged his transport vessels into a long line with his warships on his flanks and ordered his men to disembark. As the transport vessels had deep keels, however, they were still some way from the shore and the legions were forced to wade in waist deep in water to try and reach the beach. The Britons saw their opportunity and attacked, firing missiles into the ranks of the legionnaires as they struggled through the water, weighed down by their armour. The Briton cavalry charged in and out of the Romans, the height advantage of being on horseback allowing them to fight much more effectively than the Romans stuck in the water. The legionaries were taking significant casualties, and seeing this, Caesar moved his shallower keeled warships up the flanks so that his missile troops and ballistae could fire into the Britons' sides. Still, the legions were wavering with some men not even being willing to get off their transports. It was not until an eagle bearer of the 10th legion leapt into the water and waded towards the Britons that the legions rallied and rejoined the battle in earnest. The fighting was fierce and contested, with the Romans gathering to their nearest standards to try and maintain some form of cohesion, while Caesar used rowing boats to ferry men from the transports to areas where the Roman front line looked to be in danger. Finally, the Romans were able to push through the shallows onto the beach where their organization and heavy armor could come into play, at which point the Britons broke off and retreated. Caesar, without any cavalry, had no choice but to let them escape. We don't know the numbers of dead on either side, but being a contested landing, it's likely that the Roman losses were greater. Following the battle, the Romans established a camp on the beach, and the Britons sent delegates to sue for peace, probably to assess the Romans' purpose in the area. They were on home ground and could afford to wait to see what Caesar's next move would be, whereas Caesar, with no supply line, would be pressured to make the first move. Caesar accepted the peace, and the Britons sent a small number of hostages, promising more later. The cavalry that had been waylaid did try and cross once again to meet Caesar, but were caught in a storm and forced to turn back. This same storm damaged the ships that Caesar had anchored off the beach, demoralizing the Romans who could no longer escape the island. Salvaging what materials he could from the most damaged ships, Caesar began repairs. He sent one legion at a time to forage for food, whilst the others defended the camp on the beach. However, whilst one of the legions was out foraging, the camp watch reported seeing dust on the horizon moving their way. This, combined with the lack of the promised extra hostages, was enough to alert Caesar to what was happening. He gathered two cohorts and marched quickly to the legion's location. Whilst foraging, the legion had been ambushed. Scattered and focused on collecting food, the Britons had been able to kill a substantial number of them in the initial attack. The legion had managed to regain some level of discipline, snatching up their weapons, but they were surrounded by the British cavalry and chariots. British charioteers were trained to throw missiles from their chariots and then dismount to fight on foot before hopping back on the chariot when the fighting got too hard in order to regroup. This gave them the staying power of infantry and mobility of cavalry, a tactic Caesar admired but was now taking a heavy toll on the surrounded legion. Upon Caesar's arrival with his cohorts in formation, the cavalry and chariots retreated. 
The Britons had no desire to fight heavy infantry in formation in a pitched battle without their own infantry support, and allowed the legion to withdraw to camp with Caesar. However, bolstered by this success, the Britons amassed their full force of infantry, cavalry and chariots, and marched on the camp. Caesar drew out his legions to meet them. So far, he had been fighting in difficult circumstances, in water, in ambushes, against a highly mobile enemy. But this was an ideal situation for the Romans, where their formations and discipline could truly make a difference. The Britons charged, but in these conditions, the Romans had a significant advantage. Whilst the chariots and cavalry had proved highly effective against small groups of Roman infantry, with the legions in a cohesive line, they now had little effect. The Britons quickly caught on to this fact and disengaged, their chariots and cavalry leaving the battlefield. The Roman infantry was now able to surge forward and catch a portion of the Briton infantry, routing it completely. The Britons were excellent at hit-and-run tactics and ambushes, but in set-piece battles the Romans were far superior. Once again, the Britons sent a peace delegation, and Caesar, knowing that his options were limited, and that he did not have enough resources to carry out a full campaign, accepted, and then hastily withdrew from the island during the night. However, on his way back to Gaul, two ships were blown off course in a storm. 300 Romans were stranded and surrounded by a Belgae tribe, the Morini, who Caesar had only recently subjugated and were keen for spoils and revenge. The Romans were assailed from all sides with missiles in hit-and-run attacks against their small group. Caesar caught wind of this and gathered as much cavalry as he could to personally lead them to the men's rescue, managing to ride down the Gauls and save the Romans with only minimal casualties. Labienus would later be sent into the Belgae territory to winter there and reinforce Roman rule in the area. Neither the invasion of Britain nor this foray into Belgae territory were significant military achievements. However, they show why Caesar was so loved by his men. He was brave, achieving things no Roman had ever done before. He was calm under pressure, and most importantly, he would lead from the front and showed that he cared for his soldiers and was prepared to risk his life to save them. The Britain campaign had not achieved much for the Romans, but it did provide Caesar with crucial knowledge about the Britain's military, the climate, and the level of preparation that he would need to succeed, lessons he would learn from for next year. Moreover, the Roman public and senate were amazed by his feat of crossing the channel into unknown territories, and a full 20 days of thanksgiving were declared to recognize his achievement. After dealing with some administrative matters in 54 BC, Caesar began planning a second campaign in Britain. Almost 600 transports and 28 warships were built, implementing Veneti shipbuilding techniques better suited to the rough seas. Caesar called on his Gallic allies and vassals and amassed 4,000 cavalry, including tribal leaders, once again bolstering his army and minimizing the risk of revolts in Gaul. He left half of his cavalry and three legions in Gaul and crossed with five legions and 2,000 cavalry, more than double his previous numbers. This was going to be a full invasion. Caesar landed at the same place as before, but this time he was unopposed. He quickly established a camp in the area and sent out scouts, who promptly brought back some local prisoners. They informed Caesar that a large army had actually gathered to oppose the landing, but had retreated upon seeing the size of Caesar's force. Leaving a legion at the camp, he immediately set out in search of the Briton army. The Romans marched through the night and were able to catch up to the Britons in a hill fort on the other side of a river. Although the Romans were tired, Caesar was determined to confront the Britons and began crossing. The Britons' cavalry and chariots rushed down from the high ground to harass the Romans as they crossed. Caesar's allied Gallic cavalry were experienced in fighting in such scenarios and proved their value, 
chasing off the Britons who quickly retreated to the woods surrounding the fort. As the legions began their advance up the hill, they were harassed from the woods by the Britons, preventing them from making significant progress until the 12th legion formed a testudo and were able to make a rudimentary rampart in order to move over the walls. The Romans were now inside the fortifications, but the Britons were quick to escape the fort and retreated deeper into the woods. Considering the men had carried out a night march and battle, and that he did not know the terrain and whether any more Britons would be waiting for him, Caesar made camp for the night. The next day, word reached him that a storm in the night had again damaged his ships. Without the ships, Caesar would be at the mercy of the Britons, so he decided to prioritize overseeing their repairs. He commanded his army to reassemble and march back to the beach. Upon arriving, he discovered that 40 ships were beyond repair, but the rest were salvageable. Caesar ordered that the ships be brought onto the beach, and a large wall was constructed encompassing the camp and the ships. He also sent word to Labienus to build more ships in Gaul. He then set off once again to find the Britons. They were in the same hill fort, but it was a larger force than before, under the command of Cassivellaunus, a tribal leader beyond the Thames, who was appointed the leader of a united coalition against the Romans. Caesar had marched past this fort, possibly not wanting to attack such a large and fortified enemy, instead attacking exposed villages to try and draw Cassivellaunus out. At the same time, his troops were constantly harassed by the Britons' cavalry and chariots fighting skirmishes with the Roman cavalry on the flanks, luring them into the forests before turning back to inflict significant casualties. The Britons seemingly allowed the Roman advance party time to begin making a fort for the night. However, as construction began, the Britons attacked again. The Romans who were on guard were able to form a line to defend the site, but the fighting was brutal, with the Briton chariots darting in and out of the Roman formation. Caesar was forced to send a further two cohorts from the vanguard to quickly reinforce this line. The Romans were not used to the Briton style of fighting, particularly chariot hit-and-run tactics, drawing out the Roman infantry from formation who were too slow to catch them. At one point, the Britons were able to draw out a maniple far enough to create a gap, which they were able to exploit, punching through the Roman line and inflicting many casualties. It was not until the rest of the Roman army caught up that the Britons disengaged and retreated. Cassivellaunus was proving himself a cunning enemy. Caesar marched to the Thames, towards Cassivellaunus's own territories, in an attempt to draw them out. Though he was able to find a position on the river where he could cross, the legions were once again harassed by Britons amassed on the other bank, who quickly retreated once the Romans were on dry land. Cassivellaunus then made the decision to dismiss the vast majority of his army, except for 4,000 chariots, likely realizing that fighting a pitched battle against the Roman heavy infantry would be futile. A smaller force would serve him much better in a guerrilla war. It would be easier to hide, faster to move, and need fewer supplies to maintain. Given the fact that he knew the terrain and Caesar did not, this was a smart and calculated move. However, Cassivellaunus's previous wars with other Britons had made him many enemies, and his new guerrilla tactics were not popular with the Trinobantes, whose leader Cassivellaunus had previously killed. They sent envoys to Caesar, surrendering and promising hostages. The Trinobantes were second in power only to Cassivellaunus himself, and without their support, numerous tribes followed suit, surrendering to Caesar. They also provided critical intel to Caesar, including the location of Cassivellaunus' capital. Caesar marched there, another hill fort, burning all villages and fields on the way, and besieged it from both sides, 
once again hoping to draw the Briton leader into a direct confrontation. Cassivellaunus, however, did not take the bait. Although his guerrilla tactics were effective, they were taking a toll on the Britons, and the defenders within the capital quickly fled. Cassivellaunus realized he needed to gain a victory. Not wanting to fight Caesar directly though, he instead sent envoys to four allied kings in Kent, who launched an attack on the Roman camp on the beach in order to try and draw Caesar away from Cassivellaunus's land. However, the Roman fortifications were strong, and the force Caesar had left on the beach was easily able to repel the attack. Cassivellaunus was forced to sue for peace. Caesar readily accepted in exchange for hostages and tribute. Winter was closing in, and he had no desire to spend it in unknown, hostile lands. The Romans returned to the beach and sailed back to Gaul. Overall, it is hard to see the invasion as an immense military victory. Cassivellaunus had not been decisively defeated in battle nor captured, and the Romans maintained no presence in Britain. From the Britons' standpoint, it was a strategic victory, having successfully pushed the Romans out of their lands. Still, his campaigns in Britain had taken two years, and without Caesar's presence, Gaul was beginning to stir. In 54 BC, a Gallic tribe, the Eburones, under their leader, Ambiorix, successfully revolted in Belgica, ambushing and destroying the 7,000 to 9,000 strong Roman detachment that had been sent to winter in their territory at Atawetica. Following this success, Ambiorix began to besiege the Roman garrison in the Nervii territory, and a general revolt in the area broke out, the Indutio Maris and the Treveri also rising in rebellion and being supported by the Germanic tribes across the Rhine. This was a dangerous position. Caesar had spread his legions across Gaul in order to not put too much strain on the resources of one area, and thus divided, they were vulnerable targets. However, he reacted quickly marching directly to the besieged legion in Nervii territory, while Labienus fought off the Indutium Marus. Upon seeing Caesar approaching, Ambiorix gave up the siege to face this new threat and was quickly defeated, while almost simultaneously, Labienus was able to successfully repel his opponents. Roman retribution for this revolt was swift and devastating. The Eburones were effectively wiped out, while Ambiorix, according to some sources, left Gaul for Germania. To help stabilize the situation, Pompey mobilized two more legions, and Caesar himself raised another. He now had almost 50,000 men in Gaul under his command. However, this was only the prelude to something much bigger. In 52 BC, Caesar returned to Italy in order to defuse another political problem, and in the same year, another large-scale revolt started. An Arverni leader, Vercingetorix, who probably knew about the political problems in Rome, had organized an alliance of powerful Gallic tribes that, inspired by Ambiorix, were now seeking independence and had begun attacking Roman outposts and Roman allies in Gaul. Upon hearing this, Caesar quickly returned to Gaul to handle the situation. Going on one of his famous forced marches, he swiftly quelled the Senones and Canutes by taking their capitals. His next target was one of the largest towns of the Batyrigis, Novia Dunum. Vercingetorix attempted to stop Caesar's advance near the city, but the Roman heavy infantry was too much for the Gauls and they were forced to retreat, losing many, which allowed Caesar to take the city. To finish off the Batyrigis, he needed to take their capital, Avaricum. At this point, Vercingetorix started employing scorched earth tactics, and the Batyrigis joined him by burning down 20 of their towns, every one but Avaricum. The Romans moved against this settlement and besieged it, and although Avaricum was very defensible and Vercingetorix attempted to help its defenders, it fell in less than a month. 
Caesar slaughtered 40,000 locals and replenished his supplies. It was clear for Vercingetorix that he couldn't beat the Romans in the field. Meanwhile, Caesar was eager to end the rebellion before it could spread to other Gallic tribes, so he decided to strike the decisive blow by taking the capital of the Arverni, Gergovia. Leaving some troops in the area, Caesar marched with 25,000 towards this settlement, while Vercingetorix shadowed him. Gergovia was in a very solid defensive position, located on top of a high plateau, and Vercingetorix managed to overtake Caesar and positioned his army on the hills in front of the city. As he had done in previous battles, Caesar hoped to cut his enemy's supply lines in order to force them out of their defensive position, whilst he would be receiving supplies from the Aedui, his Gallic allies. However, the Gauls had occupied a hill overlooking the supply line, from where they could ensure water and grain could be transported into the city. Taking it would therefore be crucial to Caesar's plan. In a quick night attack, he was able to dislodge the Gallic garrison there and station two legions on the hill, linking this position with the main Roman camp by a trench. So far, all was going according to plan. Caesar's allies would supply him from the rear, and Vercingetorix would now be forced to either sacrifice his defensive position in order to re-establish his supply line, or be starved out. However, Vercingetorix had his own plans. He bribed the Aedui, who then also joined the revolt, attacking the Roman supplies and threatening to cut off Caesar and surround him. Once again, Vercingetorix seemed to have studied Rome's tactics deeply, as this strategy was one of Caesar's own favourite strategies. Caesar was forced to leave two legions to guard the Roman position at Gergovia, and took the other four to deal with the Aedui, quickly subduing them and forcing them to send 10,000 cavalry back to the siege with him. This revolt had Caesar worried that he might face even more revolts, and could soon be encircled by the rebels. He needed to extract his legions from Gergovia and consolidate his troops. However, the situation at the city was not looking good. The two legions left to guard the Roman camp had been hard-pressed the entire time Caesar had been gone. Furthermore, Vercingetorix had divided his forces, leaving half to defend and fortify the main Gallic camp in front of the city, and half, led by himself, to fortify positions on the surrounding hills on the Gallic right flank. With a six-foot wall now in front of the main Gallic camp and the Gallic fortifications on the hills, Vercingetorix had removed any opportunity for Caesar to encircle him and the city. Seeing the Gallic forces divided, Caesar saw an opportunity to attack their main camp in order to deal a heavy enough blow to allow his army to retreat unmolested. He sent a diversionary force of one legion and some cavalry to the surrounding hills, making a huge amount of noise in order to distract the force commanded by Vercingetorix. Then he quickly and quietly moved his remaining legions up to the Gallic camp, leaving a few cohorts in the smaller camp on the occupied hill while the Aedui cavalry were sent to flank around the Gallic left by another route. The Romans quickly clambered over the wall and fell upon the Gallic camp. The Romans initially had significant success, pushing the Gauls right up to the walls of the city, but Caesar ordered a withdrawal before the rest of the Gallic force under Vercingetorix could reinforce them. However, only one legion, the 10th, heard this order and retreated, the others continuing to press on and assaulting the city itself. Some Romans managed to climb on top of the city walls, but were quickly cut down and thrown back off. Missiles from the city walls fell into the Roman ranks as they fought around the base of the walls. Vercingetorix, realizing what was happening from his position on the surrounding hills, sent the rest of his force, headed by his cavalry, to reinforce the camp. The Roman position was now truly desperate. The initial Gallic force and the city walls were in front of them, 
there was no way of cutting a way out by pushing forward, and with Vercingetorix crashing into their flank, the legionaries were under serious pressure and were almost surrounded. The officers did their best to maintain Roman discipline and form a defensive formation. According to Caesar himself, 46 centurions died in this struggle, roughly a quarter of all the centurions present, and so maintaining any solid formation was almost impossible. The Adui finally appeared on a hill to the Roman right flank, but the Romans, unable to tell if they were allied or not, broke completely, thinking that they were about to be fully surrounded. Caesar was able to use the 10th legion and the cohorts that had been stationed in the small camp to cover the retreat, and prevented the Gauls from chasing them down, avoiding the total destruction of his army, and withdrew from the field. In his commentaries, Caesar says that only 700 men were lost in this battle, but this is likely vastly underplaying the situation. Caesar being forced to assemble a rearguard and retreating shows how disastrous the battle was, and it is likely that the Romans lost thousands, modern estimates suggesting as many as 6,000. While Caesar was fighting a losing battle against Vercingetorix at Gagovia, his best legate, Titus Labienus, was sent to deal with rebellions in northern Gaul. Local Gauls, emboldened by Vercingetorix and led by Camulogenus, were consolidating around modern Paris, which was called Lutetia at that time, and was the capital of the Parisii. Labienus had left a legion near Agedincum in order to have a supply line to Caesar, and marched with four more legions towards Lutetia. His troops took Metlosidum along the way, but their attempts to cross the river Seine were blocked by Camulogenus. Labienus was forced to retreat back to Metlosidum. Luckily for him, his scouts had found another crossing near Metlosidum. He crossed there and moved against the Gauls. However, Camulogenus used Vercingetorix's scorched earth tactic, burning Lutetia and retreating to the swamps beyond. At the same time, Labienus learned about Caesar's defeat at Gagovia, which provoked a big Gallic tribe called Belevaki, led by Corius, to rebel, so he knew that he had to retreat beyond the Seine and unite with his legion in Agadincum. Labienus' decision to divide his forces into three provoked Camulogenus into attacking him to the south of Lutetia without waiting for the Belevaki, and in the ensuing battle, the Romans used the fact that their divided forces were closer to each other. Each group supported the other, and the legions managed to defeat the Gauls with ease. Camulogenus was killed in the process, which slowed down the consolidation of the anti-Roman rebellion in northern Gaul. Caesar and Labienus both retreated towards Agadincum, where they united their forces. Meanwhile, more and more Gauls were joining the rebellion, and after the rest of the Adui joined it, even the Roman province of Narbonensis was attacked by them. Caesar and his ten legions moved through the Sequani and Linganese territory to the east, in order to gain a line of retreat to the Roman province of Gallia Transalpina. At the same time, Caesar's envoys secured a group of Germanic mercenaries who joined the Roman cavalry. Vercingetorix and his 80,000 tried to attack Caesar when the latter was trying to cross the Vingiani River, but the Romans were able to stop the attack with ease. It is not clear why, but this minor defeat either disheartened Vercingetorix or showed him that he couldn't win against the Romans in an open battle so he probably tried to recreate the factors that led to the victory at Gagovia when he retreated to the Mandubii capital of Alesia. Caesar followed him to the settlement. Alesia was a well-defended city on a hill, and Vercingetorix sent messages to his nearby allies to come to his aid. Vercingetorix was in a strong position. He outnumbered Caesar, commanding a force of up to 80,000 men, and was surrounded by allies who would be able to quickly send men to reinforce him. From his position, it should be a simple rerun of Gogovia. He would wait on the high ground for his allies to arrive so they could either disrupt the Roman supply lines or attack them in the rear. Caesar had learnt his lesson though. 
Despite his smaller numbers, he immediately began the work of fully surrounding and besieging Alesia, something which Vercingetorix had been able to prevent him doing at Gagovia. The Romans began constructing a 16-kilometer wall, fully encircling the entire city, complete with palisades, trenches and towers, hoping to cut off any escape. Vercingetorix sent his cavalry out to try and disrupt these works, but the legions were able to form a defensive line to hold them, while the German auxiliaries flanked around the side. The Germans proved to be vital to the Roman cause, and their superior horsemanship forced the Gallic cavalry to retreat back into the city, killing many as they were funneled into the narrow gates. Realizing that he would soon be completely surrounded, Vercingetorix decided to send out what was left of his cavalry at night to sneak past the Roman line and head to the nearby tribes to request reinforcements as soon as possible. Upon completing the first wall, Caesar learned from some Gallic deserters that these messengers had been sent, and so constructed a second wall, this one almost 21 kilometers long and complete with two trenches and a moat facing outwards to protect against any Gallic reinforcements, creating a donut-like structure with Alicia in the center. He next sent out huge foraging parties to collect enough food to sustain his troops for the next 30 days. In doing this, Caesar had effectively robbed Vercingetorix of his advantages. With the Romans thus defended and supplied, it was the Gauls who now faced a well-dug-in enemy, and it was now Vercingetorix whose time was running out. With an army of 80,000 men inside the city, plus the civilian population and no way of resupplying, it was only a matter of time before he was starved out. This was Caesar's magnum opus. Faced with a desperate situation, Vercingetorix made the difficult decision to expel anyone who wasn't going to be fighting – the old, the sick, women and children. He had hoped that Caesar would allow these people through the Roman defences and to safety, but Caesar was not in a merciful mood. He refused to let them pass, and the civilians were left between the walls of Alesia and the Romans, imploring both sides for food and water, neither side relenting. Over the next few days, many died of starvation and thirst, the space between the armies becoming full of the dying and dead. The Gallic allies finally arrived to try and relieve the siege, under the command of Vercingetorix's cousin, the Cassivellaunus. It is hard to say precisely how many there were. Caesar claims that the number was as high as 250,000, with modern estimates suggesting somewhere between 70 and 100,000. Whatever the true number was, all agree that the Romans were now significantly outnumbered, at least two to one. On the first day of their arrival, they quickly filled in the first Roman trench and sent across a combined force of light infantry and cavalry to probe the defenses, whilst the rest of the army set up camp. Caesar countered by sending out his own Germanic cavalry, and a fierce skirmish ensued. From their elevated position inside the city, the besieged Gauls saw that their allies had arrived, and simultaneously began massing for a sally against the inner fortifications. However, the Germans once again proved their skill, outmaneuvering and flanking their Gallic counterparts, forcing them back across the trench and into the Gallic camp. Seeing his allies defeated, Vercingetorix decided to bide his time and held off his attack. The reinforcements spent the next day constructing siege ladders, and then, at midnight, launched another attack. Taking the Romans by surprise, they found some initial success, but Mark Antony, in his first battle, was commanding this section of the wall and proved himself to be a composed and skillful lieutenant pulling troops from other sections of the walls to reinforce his position. Again, Vercingetorix began to sally out to try and help his allies, but was delayed by having to fill the Roman trench. By the time he had crossed it, Antony had successfully fought off the assault, and Vercingetorix again withdrew into the city. Following these two failed assaults, Vercesivalanus conducted more thorough reconnaissance of the Roman position, and discovered that a steep hill overlooked the Roman wall in the northern section. 
hoping to use this high ground to his advantage. The next day, the Gauls used their overwhelming numbers to attack the entire length of the outside wall, but concentrated a larger force under Vercassivellanus on this portion. At the same time, Vercingetorix again sallied out, this time attacking the length of the interior Roman fortifications, hitting wherever looked weakest. This was the toughest the fighting had been so far. Caesar, as he had done at the Battle of Sabis, dashed from cohort to cohort, urging his men on, leading reserve cohorts personally to points where the defences looked like they were faltering. Vicassivellanus began making headway, piling earthworks up against the walls in order to mount them, and using hooks and siege engines to tear down the Roman defences. Caesar committed every man he had left of his reserves, pulling every man who could be spared and sending them into the action. It was a desperate battle for the Romans. Between the two walls there would be no escape, and if the line faltered, the entire army would surely be wiped out. The Roman line was holding the Gallic army, but it seemed like it wouldn't last for long. But then, Caesar appeared at the top of the hill. Leading the Germanic auxiliaries, he crashed into the rear of the Gallic reinforcements. Surrounded now on all sides, the Gauls who had pushed through the breach were decimated and the tide of battle changed. Seeing their largest contingent broken, the morale of the rest of the Gallic reinforcements shattered and they quickly fled. With this threat thus neutralized, the Romans turned to deal with Vercingetorix, who was attacking the interior wall, and they were able to force him back into the city. With the city still besieged and his reinforcements spent, Vercingetorix surrendered. It is unknown how many Romans died, but the casualties must have been fairly significant given the intensity of the fighting, particularly at the point where the fortifications had been breached. The Gallic relief force suffered heavy casualties, the entirety of the besieged army in Alesia was either killed or enslaved, and both Vercassivellanus and Vercingetorix were taken alive. Although most of the rebel leaders were either dead or captured, the resistance against Rome was far from over, as the Paterigis, Carnutes, Belevecchi, Atrebates, Anticavi, and others were still in open rebellion. In January of 51 BC, Caesar moved against the Paterigis. This winter campaign surprised the Paterigis, who were probably unprepared for it, and soon they sued for peace, which allowed Caesar to return to his winter quarters. However, soon the Paterigis were attacked by the Carnutes for yielding to the Romans. Once again, Caesar marched swiftly and took his enemies by surprise, forcing the Carnutes to submit. The Romans made new winter quarters at Cenabum and stayed there until the spring. Leaving six legions in the area, Caesar took four and moved against the Belovaci of Corius and the Atrebates of Commius. This campaign proved difficult, as both tribes abandoned their lands and fought a guerrilla war against the Romans. Fortunately for the legions, Corius was killed in one of the ambushes, which proved to be the final straw for the Belovaci. They were convinced to seek peace, while Commius retreated to the east to continue his resistance. To the south, the Andicavi attacked Liminum and were defeated by Caesar's lieutenants. The remainder of the Gallic forces in the area attempted to defend at Uxilodunum, but were defeated by Caesar soon after. The last engagement of the war saw Commius defeated in the north, and the rebellion was over. Gaul was pacified, and Caesar won over the remaining Gallic leaders with gifts and the promise of lower tribute. He knew that the battle for Rome was about to start. The civil war that would end the centuries-long republic was just around the corner. Thus ends the first season of our series on Gaius Julius Caesar. But he will be back for the second season, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.